are recording now and that is recording so bismillah let's get this started so um, salam alaikum guys appreciate you guys joining us again and thanks for everyone who subscribed and listened to our real models podcast and a big thanks to farah who joined us for the first episode um today i'm joined by my brother uh taufiq olamwewe how are you doing taufiq you well alhamdulillah walaikum salam brother i'm good and yourself alhamdulillah i'm good i mean it's been you know it's, i mean just to give a bit of context to this, so me and Taufiq recorded two or three podcasts pre-lockdown, which never made it out, and then we sort of we had lockdown, and now we've decided. Now I've reached out to you what last week, and we decided to do another one. Is that is yeah, that pretty much behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, that's like the behind the scenes. I mean, it was yeah, it was pretty pretty crazy time. I remember we were chatting, and I think I remember after the last one we sort of recorded, which I don't know if it will ever make it on youtube or the podcast channel but we were thinking like yeah this ain't gonna be real like, yeah i think everyone's yeah. gonna be real. i think you said your missus is gonna go like shopping and like start stocking them stocking up and stuff yeah like, yeah yeah my missus is gonna do the same and it's like yeah are they like exaggerating or going over the top but yeah you know it's just it's a part of like, like you know it's you know god works in weird and wonderful ways and uh you know he is the best of planners and you know here we are after what over six months later um and it's just been crazy so how has lockdown been for you um i think lockdown it's going to sound crazy today. i think lockdown saved my life i think lockdown gave me like everyone says that fresh air, fresh air fresh air but i kind of feel like i really needed it even though at the time i didn't know i needed it and handle that firstly everyone in my family's healthy everyone's fit no one suffered from covid i know it was because at one time, it, it felt like all you could see was death, like, around the corner. Like, it was, at, um, alhamdulillah, no, no one, no one suffered any, everyone's healthy. So, for me, it was just kind of, obviously, everything stopped. Football stopped, coaching stopped. Just, <laughs> and it was just kind of like, okay, what do you do with your time? I remember, like, the first maybe two weeks, I was, it was before lockdown was lockdown. It was kind of like you... It was, you remember there was that stage where no one knew what was happening. So no one was at work. The school stopped and football stopped. But it was kind of like, oh, we'll be back in two weeks. We're yeah. just, do you know what I mean? And yeah, then, I remember um, that. I mean, we were still working up until, so I was still going to the office. The day we shut down was the day after Boris sort of came out and did that speech and said we're like shutting everything down for like three mm. weeks. I was in sort of end of March. But I do remember that sort of, sort of two weeks before where there was so much uncertainty, like... You know, we you know, in the back, in the, in the, again, sort of behind the scenes with like RTP were like, are we going ahead with the events? Are we not going ahead with the events? And then eventually, you know, we sort of made a decision internally and then thought, you know what, let's just see how things play out and then we'll announce it just before Ramadan. And Alhamdulillah, like, it worked well for us during Ramadan. Um, but yeah, I definitely know what you mean. Uh, there was that uncertainty. And, you know, I think going sort of going back to what you said you know, with regards to that sort of needing that breather, I think a lot of people felt like that. I mean, myself included. I think it's, you know, looking back and reflecting on Ramadan, like Ramadan was a lot less glamorous. Like you weren't, you know, going out for Taravi or, you, weren't, you know, we didn't have like the tent and we didn't have all these like nice ribbons and people weren't there, you know, taking pictures. And it was kind of like, you know, you're doing Ramadan in your own homes. And I think sometimes that's okay. Like, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. and I think, you know, I think we all needed that, you know, I think the world kind of just needed to switch off for even if it was for, you know, uh, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you know, and I know things have started, you know, picking back up again. Um, but I think definitely that was sort of reset button or not necessarily wipe the slate clean, but just have a, that moment of self-reflection, I think it was definitely needed. No, definitely. Um, you see, you know, lockdown's been so long. I even I didn't forget, but you should remind me, Ramadan was during lockdown. And if I take it all the way back to Ramadan, it was, yeah, that I think this, uh, it was my best Ramadan I've ever had, as in being old enough to remember it and being spiritually aware to actually, like, there was nothing to do, if that makes sense. There was no excuse. You know, normally, yeah, oh, yeah, I've got to yeah. do this, and there's work, and there's, uh, and, training, and it's like, well, you literally wake up, you fast, you no excuse to not pray, read, yeah. um, you're, you're in your house, there's nothing, there's no there's no excuses now. It's like, on the day of judgment, when you're in that moment with Allah, and Allah says, on that Ramadan, what did you do? And you can't say, ah, oh, well, my manager told me I had to be in at this time, and I was, you know what I mean? This was yeah. kind of like, 
boost your brownie points. <laughs> and uh, and I am, um, yeah, and I was very grateful for it because it kind of, it really, really, really did help me a lot because just that time to, you, you didn't care what you looked like. You didn't need to get a haircut. You couldn't get a haircut. You didn't care what you looked like. You were just kind of like, you were just locked in. Uh, and And I feel like it's the first time I've been able to build sustainable habits because of COVID, because I was in my house, sustainable habits that I've carried on after Ramadan. It's always, it's always that, oh yeah, you try and seclude your habits and make these little gains and then the world comes and the dunya attacks you and life just comes, whoa, when the season of Ramadan's done and it's kind of like, well, this year, lockdown continued so you could keep them habits because you could do it before. Why can't you continue the habits? And next thing you know, you find the habits, alhamdulillah, even today, just, just still there, which is, yeah, which is, from, is a beautiful thing to, to, to see with my own internal progress. Alhamdulillah, that's great to hear, brother. I mean, that's why, you know, they say Allah is the greatest of planets because, you know, we don't know what's in store. We don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what would have happened if, you know, COVID would have happened. So, um, mm. you know, Alhamdulillah, that's great to hear. Um, before I ask you how, you, how football is going to be or how your football will restart for you, I want to ask you just to share your story of how you started out in football um, talk about talk to me about the Burnley days, um, and then just you know give us a brief, uh, you know, just a brief sort of overview. Of what's your football career been like? Because for those of you who are listening, Taufik is a great friend of Ramadan Ten Project. You know, I've had the opportunity to sit down with this guy, you know, and chat about football. So we want to share his story, and that is what this podcast is about. Is about sort of sh- is, is sharing, you know, the real live stories of you know real muslims um and sort of real people within the community and so i just want to you know now hand over to Taufik. so if you just you know take over my brother um and, uh, i was so if i really start from the start of my football career it was kind of i just i remember having to wait for my older brother in the back of the playground and he was playing football with his friend i was probably about seven eight and you know, six, seven, probably. Yeah, I had to wait for him, and it was just kind of like instead of just watching all the time, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna join in. And then I just uh, the love, just it was that's my first early memories of playing football. It's a bit late for some, but I just remember after that moment, me and football became <laughs> we was best friends, and then uh, started joining in. So from young, I was really playing with my brother was what five years, four years older than me. So I was playing with people five, four years older than me, and just. I probably learned learn a lot from them. And then, um, yeah, and then I progressed. Obviously, I just started. I was born in Camden, so played locally. And then really, in, really, my career kind of started when I kind of noticed when I was at Camden, when I was going primary school, I got picked. I was captain of my, my year groups. I was, yeah, I was just always being picked for football stuff. And it was just kind of just took it in my stride. And year, year six is have, like, your whole borough, your district. Yeah. And, like, I was promoted into Camden District. I was made captain of my district. Like these are all from other primary schools and you're realizing that oh like I'm I'm kind of good. And then um yeah, I just remember my local team played against Arsenal when we was about ten. And I remember losing badly and just thinking, wow, these kids are special. I wanna be here. Like I love support Arsenal, like, I wanna be here. And then I just was that was it, year seven and eight. Kind of was a for me football wise it wasn't really nothing really changed it was only until I was fourteen um, I got really I really developed into knowing that I could actually do it and then um, it was when I got signed I was on trial at Mill I was at and Brentford um, I finally got did get an offer from Dagenham and Redbridge at the time when League Two I was at Leighton Orient which were League One at the time and then I remember playing against Dagenham Dagenham liking me Dagenham offered me a deal for two years a schoolboy and I was thinking okay I'm going to sign for you then everyone else is just telling me to come and train and then I'm just like worked my way up went Dagenham for two years experienced life uh, I got released in the end it's a big part of football which I learned the hard way as a kid um, I feel like in football there's a lot more downs than there is ups and it's not um, really it's not really shown to you I find I think the first time I found, like, in my whole entire life that I was not regarded as good enough was at 16, and that was kind of like, wow. <laughs> my whole world went... So how do you get over that, if you don't mind me asking? Because obviously, you know, going through that age, you know, you're going through your adolescence, you know, you've always been told that, 
you know, you're a really good footballer, you know, you're hungry, you know, you're athletically gifted, you know, you've worked hard, you know, you've always been told that, you know, everyone, no matter what field, whether it's, you know, you're in a, you know, you're going to med school or whether you're a lawyer or, you know, whether in whatever sport, you're always told that if you work hard and you just, you know, put your head down, you'll eventually make it. But then, you know, obviously um, you've done that from throughout your whole adolescence. And then, you know, when you're 16, you just said you got released and they don't prepare you for that. So how did you get over that? Um, I, I think I was, I had no choice. <laughs> that makes sense. Because when I was in school, I used to, um, from year 10, I used to miss one day of school a week. And then in year 11, you missed two days. And it was called day release where you would go to the, f- the first team and you would train with the under 18s at the time and you would miss school. And obviously that's your GCSE years and, and um, I just always set my sights and was like, oh, well, I don't need, I don't need a certificate to say that I'm smart. <laughs> Literally, I was like, I don't need a certificate to say that I'm smart. I'm good at football. I'm going to make it as a footballer. So, obviously, didn't try as hard as I could over my GCSEs and my exams. And it was kind of like, well, you didn't get the grades you should have got and you've just been released. Um, so, you have no choice <laughs> but to make sure football works because I've come from a, a family of, very good academics. My brothers, were, I'm, the, I'm the youngest, and Marshall they was all very smart. And uh, and it was kind of like you had to make football work now, Tafik. And uh, do you ever feel the pressure of that? Um, you know, you're saying that your siblings were obviously um, gifted academically. Do you ever feel that pressure from family or sort of external? Yeah, mass- massively. Especially being the youngest. I don't know if, uh, if you're the youngest, but when you're the youngest, you just talk. yeah, okay. So when you're when you're the youngest, you just get that that I don't know that pressure, man. It's just it's just oh well, and you kind of can choose who you want to be like. You can be like this one, the oldest, or the second, and it's kind of like. And I was I just always thought I was different because I was the only one that really pursued football and got signed at a club in in school. Like it was what I was doing for my family at the time is it, I was the first to do it, so I was first to get signed. I was first to play against. I don't know, Arsenal, all these clubs and and so forth. So I just felt, I felt, I did feel the pressure, but I feel like as I've got older, pressure and me were both best friends and worst enemies. Um, so I say that with, I do love pressure, but I do hate it at the same time because I know you've got to deliver and I know how hard it is to de- deliver. So I do know mentally, I'm like, oh, I've got to do all this. But I know I thrive of having to set myself that target and achieving that. So um feel that pressure sort of helps keep you alive, but that just gives that drive, that motivation yeah. to keep you out of bed. Yeah. I think if when I don't have pressure, for example, when I know I'm the first choice centre centre half or the first choice in my position on the team, I don't play my best. But if I've got someone that I'm looking at and like he's good, you know. If I don't, if I'm not today, if I'm not on my job today, I might not play next week. And when I have that environment and I have to constantly, it's straining and stressful as it is, I'm a better person because of, because of it and a better player after it. And um, so I do love the pressure. And then, like I was saying, 16 now, um, I just find myself in limbo. I ended up fast forwarding, um, finding a, a scheme that played football and we did a bit of education and they paid us at the same time. So it was like, wow. And it was, but it, it, the dream only lasted for a year. It was in a non-league club. And then after a year, they cut the budget. Some, someone was like, no, this is not right. And they just took the money away and was like, all right. And I ended up in college. Um, so my brother was a teacher in a school um, in Hackney and then um, Tower Hamlet's Hackney. And then I ended up, he ended up getting me in as a second year, obviously a second year of college. And it was like, and I, academic, academically, I hated, so I hated school. So I hated just having to be, and this was a sixth form. So then I had to go back into school wearing smart clothing. And I've just had a year out of school playing football. And it was just like, if anything can make you chase your dreams, it was that moment. I remember, I, I, like, it's funny, I say to my brother, like, I used to be in C's teaching, I used to be in my class, and my class that he got me into was like, we did sports and I was doing business as well. And <laughs> can you imagine, I had three kids in my class. I had four, 
well, one never used to come in, had one had didn't barely spoke any English, was from Brazil, and they had um, a very like shy boy in my class. So you can imagine I'm very talkative, active. I just come from being a footballer. All, the, all of this in my school, school years were amazing for me. I'm in a completely different school, completely different environment, got no one in my class. And it was like, I'm sitting there like having to be in at eight o'clock. I might not have a lesson till 11. I was like, what the hell? Why am I in the school? I just, and then that, that, that time that made me like, I, when I look back for the, what happened after that, I always say in everybody's story, there has to be some sort of pain. But when you talk about it or some sort of like neglect, someone says, no, you're not good enough. And when I reflect it to you, I say it in a second. But when I was going through it, it was years. <laughs> so it felt like years anyway. And obviously it was months. And I was just, I remember being in the classroom, just looking out like, this is not for me. This, as I was literally telling myself, this is not what God allowed for me on this earth to do. I was literally saying to myself, this is not what I was made to do. And um, it just made me work harder. I just got in a routine. I was waking up for Fajr, uh, praying, going for runs, using lampposts on the street as like combs, or, like finishing um, sixth form and going straight to the gym. And then, alhamdulillah, I got an uh, opportunity. It was called a Nike Academy at the time. They just cut it. And it was like the best unsigned boys in the UK. And I went on this trial. And out of like hundreds of boys, there was only two of us got selected. And I, I always say that was probably my biggest miracle in life. And I got selected. And, I, and then Allah blessed me. And then it was kind of like from that moment, I could take football seriously again. And then, yeah, it, it just went up from there. I, I ended up spending some time at the Nike Academy. Um, and then I got signed at Burnley um, from the Nike Academy after spending some time there. And um, when I was at the Nike Academy, I did have some very, very, very special life experiences. I went, um, I went to America to play against Portland Timbers in Oregon. I went to the Nike headquarters. I spent 10 days there. I went to Italy to play against um, ASC Roma. I actually went to Rome. Um, I actually went to Sicily when I was in Italy. I went to France and I played against PSG at Paris in their training ground. Um, and then we played against Barcelona in London at Wembley. So, and that was in front of my family and friends. So you can imagine um, being in college, what, maybe six months before that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, maybe being in college six months before that. And then all of a sudden you're playing in front of Wembley, like in, in, in Wembley, in front of your family and your friends against Barcelona. And it was like, yo, this is crazy. And we won. And then, um, yeah, that's when I got signed. I got picked up by Burnley during that time. And um, yeah, man, it was just really, it was really special, a special time for me. Um, and when I went to Burnley at the time, it was top of the championship. Um, and ended up winning the league, getting promoted to the Premier League. So my first year championship, second year, my Premier League footballer. So think about a year ago now, maybe a year and a half, I've gone from sitting in that college room to now playing for a championship Premier League club. And I just remember being relentless with my work ethic and my prayers at the time. Because I've uh, it's one thing I do, part to, I don't maybe talk as much about, but Come my my parents are very prayerful people, so I come from a very like Islam was was rammed in from young. Uh, yeah, I was going to say what um what what role did faith play in this? Before we go to now talk about your time at Burnley, like what was you know was it the was that the ignition as to say um, um, for you in terms of getting sort of getting kick started again after sixth form or during sixth form? Definitely, because I feel like as 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 Muslims, you can be raised and, and your parents can try and drum and force things. They sent me to like learn Arabic and stuff as a kid. And, and then I think you get to an age where you make a decision to quote unquote be a practicing Muslim or just, I don't know, live your life. And the wind. yeah, and it, and it kind of just naturally happens environments. Uh, so I kind of found myself in that, that limbo. And I think it's when I did get released and I did start to meet other, like, like I had a brother that was uh, with me at one of the teams before I went to college. And this brother would, oh, mashallah, may Allah reward him. This guy would 
He would bring his prayer mat to football training. He'll go to the change room and start praying. I'd be thinking, this guy. So obviously, I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I feel bad. I'm like, I'm Muslim too, and he can pray and do this. Why can't I? So then we started praying together, and like this. Then, then, then I just started wanting. At last, I, I don't know. Just something in me started wanting me to do more with my religion. And obviously, it's hard. You're still young. You're still 16, 17 years old, 18. You're still going through life, and. But that's when I consciously made the decision that you know, all these things my parents have taught me since I was a kid, I'm now going to take the ownership and, and really try and implement this into my life. And, and um, yeah, it, it literally, it helped. I went to my, the school my brother was teaching in, uh, was I'll probably say 95% Muslim school, which I didn't. I grew up in a school where it's mostly, yeah, not, not many Muslims at all. Um, so for that, in them years, it was good. Um, Juma, they had that Juma on a Friday. They had like a prayer room. They had like a do area in the school. Like, yeah, I, I, in my school, I was the Mr. Popular trying to go pray Juma on a Friday, having to sneak out of science in the fourth period, trying to do my would do while I hit once it's in class because... Yeah, we get caught my, what, I think. Yeah, I get, I, get, I get caught washing my feet in the sink. <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> Reputation's gone. <laughs> <laughs> <That'd> be, <laughs> all them years of working hard to be Mr. Popular it's just it's gone down the drains so <laughs> um, yeah, but, I mean, that's, yeah. A, that's actually really impressive I mean for a you know you said a school's 95% Muslim which helps so you know it's quite impressive that they you know do take out Jumma because you know what you're saying there about ownership I mean you know I think again similar I think everyone goes through that stage and I think you can go one way or another or, mm. you, or you are still on that journey and for me it was sort of just after uni I sort of said, you know, like I'm sort of out, I'm out, of, you know, uni, you know, what am I, what am I trying to achieve here? And that's when I sort of started sort of keeping my head down and sort of saying, right, okay, this is, you know, my parent, you know, I kind of felt that graduation for me was a point where, you know, this is where I'm, I'm finally a man, you know, I've got the, gone through the education process. It's now time to go out in that real world. But, you know, everything mm-hmm. else I've been taught is that, you know, Allah's the one who provides, he's the sustainer, you know, he's you know the most merciful and he's the one who, you know, ultimately, you know, guide you on the right path. And that's when I kind of, for me, was that moment where, you know, I kind of sort of changed tracks a bit and sort of looked at myself and reflected and said, you know, this is how I want to go down. So, you know, again, going through that, going through what you've said, just sort of reminded me of sort of my personal experiences. I'm sure it's reminded quite a few, a uh, few others listening to the to this of their sort of um, experiences. And I think one thing also to add is that everyone's still on their journey as well. So if you're not quite, yeah, there, you know, everyone's, you know, not everyone's, you know, you're only sort of in competition with yourself, essentially, you know, don't compare yourself to others is the thing I'd say on that. Um, but yeah, um, you are saying uh, Burnley. So you're a Premier League footballer or, and you're at Burnley. Tell us what the lifestyle was like. Was it fast cars? And, you know, was the money... It, it, I wasn't on the big money. I wasn't on the big money. Alhamdulillah, I was. I was on. The mark. Oh, guys, it's a bit on my phone. Yeah, I was on. Alhamdulillah, I was on. I was on good money for my age at the time. Um, it wasn't no crazy money, life changing money. It was just most of my friends were in uni, and I was getting paid, but yeah. they was making debt. If that makes sense, so it kind of was like. I learned a lot coming, not coming from money, um, and then having a bit of money um, taught me some lessons that I, I value now. Um, one thing I did, I always say this: um, I'm, I passed my driving test, and within a week I got a car. So I just wanted the car to show off, and I remember getting a car, and it was like a finance these these haram these people they call me on that jungle. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't, I had no knowledge. May Allah forgive me, but they um, had me on like this PCP four year car and re- lease, whatever you do, and you um, enter this because you, know, you get the car straight away. They say you don't have to pay for the first month. You get the car. And yeah, but then you just realise you have to keep the car for like four years or pay off a certain amount before you can give the car back and then you don't get enough for the car. You just Anyway, so uh, that was my first mistake, I should say, on the board of life lessons of being a footballer, um, dealing with the pressures of just understanding that all my friends in my team drove. They all had nice cars in my age group and I didn't drive and I needed to have a nice car as soon as possible. Or 
nothing would happen. I just don't know like, what all was. I just thought that some, the world would end if I didn't get this straight away. Um, maybe if I didn't do that later in life, I wouldn't have had to keep providing for this car that I would have to sustain yeah. even once I did get released. We'll go into that in the future. But um, initially, it was, um, it was amazing. Um, growing up and being from Camden, um, growing up in Hackney, uh, and playing for a club like Burnley, um, in the middle of Burnley, near Manchester, obviously the first time I've I've lived on my own. Um, I was away from home when I was at Nike Academy, but this was the first time I had my own independence. Like I had my own key to the house. I come home when I want to come home. I sleep when I want to sleep. My parents never know. And um, I find it's kind of like the uni experience, maybe when um, you first get away from that the family home and you're old enough to do, you're old enough to go out. You can go and explore the world. Nothing can, no one can say anything to you. Your parents can never find out anything you do. And um, obviously, just coming from such a spiritual place of a journey, kind of was like a, a I don't know, a roadblock. I would say, like a, it took me, a, it took me on a detour with all the temptations that come with being a footballer. And I quickly, I think, I soon realized that it was just all not worth it. Like the the lifestyle of 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 the footballer or the things that you think you have to do as a footballer and I remember one of the most one of the things I remember most was I used to always play drummer on a Friday and then I just stopped being able to play drummer and because I had training and it was just kind of like it was I don't know how to it was just really like what was the club? I, like? I mean because did Burnley not were well, Burnley aware that you know you were a Muslim and so yeah, the first day I, come, I went there, I, I told him I'm Muslim. I'm Muslim. I said I, I only eat halal food, and they looked at me like, "What's halal?" Like, I'll never forget. Like, "What's halal food?" I was telling the guy, "Like, would you know what halal food is? Like, halal chicken when you get from a butcher." He was like, "Anyway, then anyway, a couple of days later, he comes back and he says, "Oh yeah, halal." He's like, "Yeah, I can get you some." Um, he says, "Yeah, this one piece of chicken, like on a certain day, like this certain type of chicken is like, from the halal butcher." And um, so, <laughs> I don't know if it was, but you know, they, they told me at the time. It's it's crazy to think even how how society. This is only what two, three years, three years ago. So yeah, and and um, so then I, they knew. I'm um, I kept the habits of when I used to pray with my friends from once I learned at sixteen, seventeen to pray at football and just be yourself. No matter what stuff was happening, that I was fitting in. I still always prayed, so it's like um, I always went to the side and found like a change room and just prayed my two rakat. Um, I prayed my salah, my two rakat, my um, zohar and asr prayers if I was at training, and um, yeah, it just kind of was like that was how I kept. I, I always say how I kept myself sane because if I didn't have that, I don't think we would have this conversation. I don't think my decision-making would have been RTP and learning and trying to do more with my life. Um, but yeah, at the time it was, I remember just not being an outcast, but just, I was from London. I was a loud black boy. That's why Black Lives Matter now, but I was a lot. And to them, I was a loud black boy. I, I spoke too loud. I was, uh, it, I was the things that we are fighting for now that I, I was just myself, but it was not. It wasn't. It wasn't right to be yourself at the time, um, and you just kind of felt yourself always fighting, and no one really understood you. It was just really. It was really tough at the time. I remember mentally, got to a point where I wasn't playing as much. Um, I just felt like my manager, and he didn't understand me as a human being, as a person, let alone as a footballer. Um, you start playing within yourself in your in your in your shell. And then I just really tried to just help the younger players that were from London to be better than me and learn from the mistakes I made. If it, even if it is that I maybe spoke too much, well, it shouldn't be wrong to speak. But even if I did speak too much in their eyes, just teaching them not to speak. It sounds crazy, but like not to put yourself in a position where you allow them to judge you. And um, But do you think that your faith of the, the colour of your skin held you back at Burnley? in light of what's gone on recently and also what happened to the City game a few, what was it, a few months ago now? Or after yeah. That? Um, obviously, you always have to be careful with what you say just because you're still within the industry, you still got people there. I don't, 
I don't know if it held me back, but I believe that I could have been helped more. For example, there was when I was there, there was no black staff members. Like there was just not one person in the whole entire club that was black. The only the black person was a lady, and she was a cleaner. Um, <laughs> and so, with the players as well in the first team, I owned there was probably there was there were literally two black players. One played; he was like the superstar, and the other one, um, he never really he never really got a look in. And um, other than that, we had maybe two, three, four in our team, in our 23s, but um, as in within the club. But that, I don't know. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a really, it wasn't a team that was it, was, it wasn't a very cultural team at the time anyway. Most of the players were from England or Scottish or Irish. Maybe they had one or two foreign players. They was at the start of foreign players coming to Burnley. So it was difficult. I'm not gonna lie at all. It was difficult, and and yes, in spite in what with everything going on, I think if I was there now with everything going on, it would maybe be a lot different. But um, at that time, yeah, it just it just it it it, it was what it was. It wasn't um like you know, like you say. I I don't think we can say the banner sums up the club, but I I can say it sums up. A majority of of thinking up north, especially, especially being from London, yeah. I grew up with all types of cultures. Like I literally didn't see anybody for anything other than who they were. Um, I think up there, I was, yeah, it's just too much for them. <laughs> it sounds much. It's, it's too much. Uh, that it was too. I was too outspoken. I, I think they would have liked me to be a lot more quieter. If that makes sense. I mean, ultimately, I mean, the way I look at it is, is that you are who you are and to be successful in this world in the Arkadar, you have to be yourself, mm-hmm. regardless of what anyone says. I think, you know, if someone's naturally introverted, they're going to be most comfortable and they're going to do their best work if, you know, they be themselves. If someone like yourself, who's, you know, very, you know, who I see as someone who's very extroverted, you know, you're going to be most comfortable when you're sort of, you know, saying what you saying what's on your mind, being that, you know, leader, that alpha in the football team. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think, you know, for, you know, I'm going to criticise Burnley here as a, um, as a club, but I think for individuals to hold that against you, I think was, you know, it, it, it is wrong. And, you know, I think what this whole Black Lives Matter, um, well, how, how do I word it? it? You know, this whole sort of these issues we're seeing now, I think, you know, it's not only highlighting that, but I think it's, you know, starting to put some people to task on this. And Mm. I I mean, I don't know what your thoughts is. I mean, I'm more positive now about, um, you know, the whole discussion about race. And, you know, I think that it shouldn't have never got to this stage, in my opinion, but Mm. where we are. And I think, you know, the the George, what happened with George Floyd, what happened with Jacob Blake recently, I think is only putting things in, in the limelight more and you know it's a shame that it's taken this much you know i think it's a shame that it's taken you know someone or several people to lose their lives to get to this stage um you know i don't know what you know don't know what you know i'm spoken to you since um the whole george uh you know the george floyd murder happened you know what's your have you what's your piece on this you know i want to give you the opportunity to talk about this you see with Obviously, because it is an incident that was isolated within America, and and I, I say the some I always used to say social media was kind of like not a curse, but um, I just think everything was too accessible. Um, but I think in this incident, it was it was it was beautiful, as in obviously his death was tragic and it was disgusting, but it was beautiful to it unlocked the truths of society that people try to hide. Yeah. So. It, that could have happened before and they would have just said he died, he passed away. Yeah. Um, he struggled with police and he passed away. But you saw a man for eight plus minutes with his knee on somebody else's neck because of the colour of his skin. Yeah. And when you understand that's how somebody feels about you, just because you're black, it, 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 it hurts. And, and when I relate it back to the UK, UK is systematically it's, 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 it's the way it is in the UK is it's subtle yeah, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's yeah I think yeah. for me what, what what made it well what brought it to light was the protests we had so obviously we had 
the Black Lives Matter protests for a couple of consecutive weekends. But then I think there was a weekend when the far right came out and that was, I mean, some of them scenes were disgusting because for me, what I was just taken aback by was the fact that people were more upset about a statue, a bit of metal being taken down or defaced than they were the, a person who's lost his life unjustly. And I think that kind of just summed up, that kind of for me sums it up is the fact that it won't be in your face, it'll be really subtle, but you know, God forbid you say anything about Churchill or, you know, you take something or you question the history and they all just come screaming out. Mm. They always say, though, history is written by the one who wins. So um, it's funny, like, when I, when obviously the Black Lives Matter movement, it helped educate us. And I say us as in even my friends and my family and just people around us because it opened my eyes to what my my parents would go through just to get here and the things that they went through when you think about it um, and, and how things were back then and then you think about like how much we really suffered like in school whenever you heard about Black History Month the first thing they ever teach you is you were slaved they didn't teach you about Black history before like what was Black history do you know what I mean they just told you you was a slave like that yeah. sort of manipulation of power trying to make you understand that you, they are above us. That's what they wanted you to feel. And with society, people don't still see it. Like, okay, in football, I think everyone thinks that football is not a racist sport for some reason, maybe because there's a lot of talented black players. But when you look at the power moves and what people, the people that really make decisions in football, there is no one that's really black. There's no black managers. There's no black chairmen. There's no black CEOs, there's no black head of like they're very rare. They become. They said that there was the first black referee that was in the football league out of all night in four divisions of English football. He was the first black foot, um, referee to be instated in the last like maybe 12, 15 years. Yeah, I remember the you first... guys when was the black referee when we were growing up watching football, sort of in, in the sort of nineties, two thousands, and then there hasn't been one since, which I was actually quite shocked about. Do you, do you know what I mean? But now I feel like with a token, and I hate a token gesture because it's not like they don't deserve this. It's not like, and I say the same with Asians. There's, there's, I don't know. I, from my life, I couldn't tell you why there's no Asian footballers. Yeah. Or a handful. It doesn't, if, you can't tell me they're not talented. Yeah. I grew up with talented Asian footballers that wanted to be footballers. Like, and that's just in general black people. So I feel like... Well, just going on touching on the Asian um, footballers, do you think that's down to the fact that Traditionally, in Asia, especially in Asian house, households, you know, kids are sort of uh, pressured into sort of going down the academic route, whether it's doctor, accountant, engineer, lawyer. Do you think that's part of it, or do you think it is? It it, it plays a part, but I don't think it's the be or end all because everybody at the end of the day chooses their life, and I think there's kids that were a reb, not rebels, but they choose their own life and they know they're good enough and they probably want to do it. And they probably do try to do it, but just don't stay full short because for whatever reasons, the system. But I do obviously believe that obviously if the most majority of parents are saying, listen, you can't play football on a Saturday when you need to go training, you're not going to make it if you've got kids that are playing every Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and you're only not allowed to play and you're trying to sneak out once a week to play football. Hours-wise, and they say the 10,000 hour rule of how many hours you need to do to perfect the craft, you're not going to perfect it if you're not being able to express yourself, which I think is a shame. But I also, I understand because like I said, remember when I was 16, I was forced to make this work because yeah. of my decisions, because I made decisions not to educate myself in the right way. Alhamdulillah, I feel like I'm a very educated person and I, I feel like I'm very well-spoken. I feel like I'm very well-spoken. I feel like I'm a very educated young man. Allahumma barak. I just believe that I might not have gone through certain things if I had that plan B or if I had the thought process of educating myself more, so coming out with A's, B's, and I'm a good footballer. It was kind of like football was the only way. And I think when a child becomes football is the only way, um, this industry will eat you, spit you out, and leave you depressed with so many issues that you have to deal with later on in life. And and you won't have no one else to blame but yourself. And I think that's where a lot of problems become and people get addicted to things and trying to escape and drugs and drinking becomes very frightful within. 
footballers. I think I remember when I was like 17, 18, I saw a statistic. Um, 98% of footballers that turn professional after the age of, um, do not kick a ball again after the age of 21. Really? So when I saw that stat, I remember saving it on my phone thinking, 98, and they turn professional footballers, by the way. They make it to the age of professional footballer. And by the time they're 21, they never play football again. And I couldn't believe it. Obviously, now, being 23 and having friends that did turn pro, and some of them don't even play football anymore. Like, because of, because of what football... What, it's, we would be all afternoon talking about how the system is so hard to break down and how much fights you're fighting internally just to stay sane to play this game. Because they once you get... Once they get you <laughs> to get out, is tough, but alhamdulillah. That's why I say with Islam, it's allowed me to legit, legitimately leave everything to the God of Allah, like leave everything to Allah. Yeah. And and I adopted that mentality. Okay, it's not when they say tie your camel, I tie my camel, I tie my camel by working as hard as I can every single day and improving myself every single day as a footballer. Alhamdulillah, I was blessed with talent. Um and and that's why I say to myself, it's only now I get older. I literally say, I, you've worked hard for so many months now. You've prayed your salahs. You have do whatever you need to do that with that Allah has told you to do. And the final moment now is to maybe get that opportunity or that trial. Leave it to the color of Allah. Like, like literally, like you say you believe in Allah. Like Allah can make any, everybody in the whole world could be against you. And Allah says it's for you, it's for you. And everybody in the world could be for you. And Allah says it's not for you, it's not for you. So if you adopt that mentality, I kind of think life is very simple when you're striving for things that are very personal to you. Because at the end of the day, it's a dream and you put many hours into this craft. Like every single boy as a child, you ask them, what do you want to be when you're old? And they tell you professional footballer. Mm -hmm. So you're competing against 10 versus 10. It's not like you're competing... And maybe one in 20 that don't want to be a footballer. Maybe even, it's probably stats but bigger than that. So when you know that, it's not for everybody. And only 11 players play on the pitch at the end of, at the, end of the day. And the squad's probably about 20. So there's a lot of time you might not even play. But when you know you put everything you possibly could and you pray your salahs and you, and you, edu and you understand why your purpose here is on earth and it's not to play football. Your purpose on here is to serve a lot. So when you realise you like to play football and you it's allowed to, to, to earn a living from this, okay, do your utmost, but never forget the, the Islam and, the, and why you're here and what your purpose is in this world. And, and as I've got older, them times at Burnley really taught me that. It really let me know about Islam, really educating myself, having so much free time, um, having the struggles of life and just and just wanting to, wanting more and not feeling like I had everything. I, I didn't feel a whole. When I went, when I deviated from the path of, and it was kind of like finding myself again. And I feel like getting released and all them things, they really did happen for a reason at the time. And everything was so hurt. It really hurt. Thinking that you've made it out of the hood, the I say quote unquote, the 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 tough environments that you grew up in, and finally made it as a footballer, you're like, yeah, this is me. And then getting dragged out of that situation and plopped right back into the same area you thought you would never have to see again. Um, I think it's probably one of the most humbling, hurtful experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, having to go through that, uh, you see your parents are not, they're, dis they're not disappointed, but they are disappointed at the same time. You know, you've let people down, you've got the pressures of life. It's just, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. That is, that is deep. And, um, thanks for sharing that. Kind of, that's, that is difficult to share. And um, you know what, I wish you all do the well for you. You know, I wish you all the best in your career. And inshallah, you know, um, before, you know, we do wrap up, I've got, three quick fire questions for you. Um, first one is what advice would you give young people um, in terms of whether they want to be young footballers or sports or whatever field they want to go and what advice would you give them? Um, especially going through the experiences you've gone through and you've just shared with us today. 
Um, secondly, what is next for you with regards to football and um, what is what is actually happening, especially with the current pandemic? Um, and then my third question, I've actually just forgotten it. I'll stick to them two questions then for now. <laughs> okay, to answer the first one, I would say regardless of all the all the negatives you might have heard or the, the, the dark and gloomy, the only reason, there's been so many good times you know, and I won't even try and underestimate it's all been bad uh, there's been so much amazing experiences football has given me I would say to any young person trying to be in football to understand the stories I've shared are a part of what you see as football so I think as a kid you see football as you know Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo and fast cars and and the rest of it and the, some of the stories I've shared is what comes with football and I'm like, my parents are proud of me and my brothers and my things. And you just feel like they're not when you get disappointments and not back to football. But in football, no matter how well you are, somebody will tell you your time is done. And when you need to understand that getting into football is just an opinionated game. One man says you're not good enough and another man says you're the best thing since sliced bread. And what I would say is the, the only way to psychologically deal with that is have... Your, your faith, your Islam, your deen in there, because that's when you understand that whatever happens is by the cut of Allah. And Allah Mubarak, you're talented, if you are talented, and you love the game. And sometimes maybe you might not be a footballer, you might be a football rat, you might become a manager, you might become a coach, you might become a referee, you might become a sports double, you might work within the sporting industry, I don't know. But once you leave it to Allah, you work as hard as you can, and then you find a job that makes you happy, you're winning in life. Because I wouldn't say there might be that many people in life that are genuinely happy with what they have to do, having to wake up and do so. That would be my um, advice. Um, and my second, and just to add that, always have a plan B. Plan C, plan D, plan E. <laughs> As many, and, and, and yeah, that would be my plan, um, advice. And with regard to myself, Alhamdulillah, like, obviously, like I said, um, COVID allowed me to to train. You, when you get released, you obviously, when you're for professional football, you train football every day. Um, when you come out of that and then you can't train, for, train every day, you find a job and it's harder, your eating habits become bad. Um, it's the first time I've been able to actually just train and get my body and my, my mind into the shape it needs to be to really take them next steps. And, uh, Alhamdulillah, and, and because of that, it's now put me in positions to, Inshallah, by the will of Allah, that I will have a contract at the end of this or when the season, now the season is now started, um, pre-season has started, I should say, and kind of trials are, and people you can go on invited into places and trying to push up the football pyramid again. Um, yeah, that's, this, that's where it's at right now, just trying to stay fit, sharp, healthy. Um, when does the season start for you guys? Is it the same week as the Premier League? So, it's set of no, so, the, so the Premier League starts on the 12th, right? Yeah, we st um, so League One, League so Premier League, Championship, League One and Two start on the twelfth, and National League, which is the under League Two, um, and National League North and South, they start on the third of October. Mm -hmm. So we was pushed back because of some is being it was something to do with being uh, the same standard as seen as professional as in the Premier League and that and not having the ability to facilitate the same infrastructure yeah. they would there. So we was deemed as we need more time to see how we can make it work. So um, it did give me more, it gives you more time to get fit, give more time to get healthy. And, and yeah, I'm literally now I'm just literally, I mean, I've learned a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot during um, Ramadan and this lockdown. So I'm just kind of really looking forward to my next chapter in my life. Alhamdulillah, I've learned a lot about myself and, and and everything and I just I can't wait I've got like so much ideas and plans and by the will of Allah inshallah that I will be able to share them with the world and my story and and climb back up the football ladder so yeah everyone just makes some duas that Allah gives me <laughs> inshallah gives me, gives me what I want and what I'm dreaming for thank you very much I really appreciate your time my brother um, before you know, we wrap this up. Uh, if people want to follow you on social media, etc., how can they find you? So on Inst I'm on Instagram. Um, it's just Taufik T A T A O F I Q, and then Olo Olo. So O L O. So I'm first of my second name, just nice and short. And then on Instagram and um, on Twitter, I should say it's my full name, just Taufik Olomoewe. 
um, yeah, and I'm not on anything else. Um, yeah. No worries. Not, thanks thanks for sharing, and um, I really do appreciate this. And if listen, we'll be following you, and you know, for everyone at RTP, we'll be rooting for you. So you know, inshallah, um, please do sh- you know continue to share your journey with us because you know you are. You know what you've just told us there. You know you are a role model for you know everyone in the community. So you know Jazakallah here for sharing with us, and um, really do appreciate that. And I just want to say a big thanks to everyone who's joined us or who is listening to us, um, whether you've downloaded on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud or wherever you know you get your podcast from. I really do appreciate that, and would also love it if you guys can give us a, a follow on the um, on our social media channels. So it's at Ramadan Temp Project or at Openiftar, and that's on. Um, Twitter and Instagram so we really do appreciate your support um, once again Taufik my brother really good really good speaking to you um, do appreciate uh, you taking your time out this afternoon and again like I said we look forward to hearing your story and we look forward to you know seeing you continue continuing your journey so um, yeah all the best, my brother. No, no problem man thank you guys for having me RTP is a part of my heart man They've, you guys have done so much for me that you won't even understand so I can't even yeah normal will be appreciate hearing that so um, yeah thank you very much guys and um, you know appreciate it and uh, keep get downloading and uh, subscribe to the uh, podcast so just like all I guys